I, can we have, can, can we, can the two of you come up? You can, do you want to sit on the table or? Yeah, is that good? All right. Wait, hang on. We got I, I have a number of things I want to, I really want to cover. So uh, I wanna, we're going to talk about All right. Hey, so introduce yourselves first. Hi, my name is Teresa. Um, I'm a sophomore. I'm from Long Island, New York, and I'm pre-med. You're pre-med from Long Island. All right. Hi, I'm Miranda. Um, I'm a junior. I'm from Pittsburgh, PA, and I'm a crim major. Latrobe, PA? Pittsburgh, PA. Oh, Pittsburgh, PA? All right. Well, wait, hang on. It reminds me I got to turn this on. All right, there we go. All right, y'all. So here's what, here's, um, we're going to talk about teams, and, and I want to have you just, I want to just have a conversation with, with you all just about, about teams and what it means, and, um, and, and, we're, and, and I want to start out by talking about class, and, and it's teams and divisions, and, I, and, and one of the things that, you know, I, I'm seeing is this, you know, growing amount of divisions that we see, right? That really is, I mean, you all don't really understand it. If you had been alive in my first 20 years, you would, you would have an understanding of how much things have really sh shifted, because they have. And we're creating these really intense teams, and the teams are leading to divisions, and I'm not really sure what to do about it. But I want to first start with some socioeconomic things. So uh, imagine that you know, wealth in society, like you, wealth is going to get divided up into different groups of people, like who controls more wealth, who controls less wealth. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, it's never just the people that work hardest have the most wealth because, you know, th this is just kind of standard. If you, if you just are the first one out the gate, you get to set the rules for everybody else. And so, you know, the, the people, whoever it is that kind of establishes themselves as the leaders of a particular group or organization, they can decide if for whatever reason they became the leader. Maybe it was chance, maybe it was because they did some really heinous thing, maybe because they're really talented. There are a number of reasons, right, why you would be out of the gate first. But once you are, then you can set standards for other people and how things happen. And so that's the nature of wealth. So the question is now, now that we've got all this wealth and we've got to decide how to distribute it in society. Like, what is fair? What's fair? Okay, y'all? Right? Like, how, like, really fair, meaning that the people that work hard have an, really have an opportunity to earn the kind of wealth that they want to earn, and the people that are lazy don't just, be, aren't, like, given things, and people who are really talented are able to be rewarded for their talents, and people who are really kind of sleazy and working behind the scenes and you know really getting in positions where they steal other people's money can't do that and so like which you know often happens and so we got to find a way to to fair, fairly and equitably divide up the wealth in society okay because we're always doing that because you can raise taxes on one group and lower it on another group and you know there are all sorts of things that we can do to ensure that there's amount a certain amount of fairness and 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 like an equitable arrangement and we talked about that with regard to race in in this country and how you know I talked right remember when I talked about like how people of, of white ancestry really just as a collective group got such a head start in so many ways okay so wealth wealth is is everything that you own minus all your debts your major so you know your the money your stocks your everything that's tangible assets intangible assets okay minus all your debts and that's your wealth so I want the two of you to decide how you think we should equitably uh, distribute that or how it should be. And what, what I'm, I'm going to show you some graphs. And what you're going to do is, the way we do this, is we divide the, the, the world up, a population up into quintiles, meaning like the poorest 20%, the second poorest, et cetera, et cetera, and then the richest 20%. And what's fair that like the richest 20% would have of all the wealth that's available, and what's fair that the poorest 20% would have, okay? You got that? Or should it just be equal across the board? So, go to the, you can 
kind of turn, yeah, you can kind of turn around. So what's the ideal distribution of wealth in the United States? Okay? All right, go to the first one. So note here that the, the, the poorest... 20, the poorest 20% and the richest 20% have the same amount. So this would be basically saying, hey, the, the ideal way is for everyone to just be equal and we just force everyone to be equal and that's the best possible thing. Okay, next one. And here's another one, that the richest 20%, yeah, but they get more. They get 30% and then like 25 and 20 and down. Okay, that it's the, the, those who, do, who are the wealthiest you need some people at the top to, who have more wealth and then they set the standard and they're maybe creating jobs and they're doing things, they're investing, they're doing things, right? So maybe like, okay, but if you work really hard, you get rewarded a little more for what you're doing, okay? Okay, you might argue, okay, that's fair. Next one. How about this one? Where the poorest get like 5% of all the wealth. So 20% of the people of all the wealth, let's say in the United States, the poorest get get. Five percent, the force twenty percent of the people get five percent of that, whereas the richest twenty percent get almost forty percent. All right, that's option C. Or option D is where basically the poorest forty percent have doesn't mean they don't have income because they're working somewhere, right? I mean, there's somebody who's cleaning this room at night every night. They come in here and they clean the room, for example, right? And then the middle. The next one, and then look at the richest 20%, they're like at 85% of the wealth, they're controlling it, okay? So the question is, which one would you choose? And I, and I should add that, Miranda, you identify as lower, like lower middle class, working class? Like working class. Like working class, I think. Okay, and Teresa, just so the class has a sense of this. Like upper middle class. Okay. All right, so what, what would feel fair? Option A, B, C, or D? A, B, C, or D? What's you, what, in your ideal world, what would be ideal? No, go, go ahead, each one of you answer. Um, I'm in between B and C because I don't think it's fair for everyone to get the same, or just like log logistically speaking, like then there's no like, um, incentive for people to mm -hmm. like work hard and I just don't know how that's gonna play out and so I'm just in between B and C because I feel D is really extreme but it's just hard because it's hard to know like I don't know how much like 10% of wealth what that looks like for 20% of people like I don't know like what that means for their living yeah. standards and stuff yep. so that's why I'm in between B and C okay and Miranda. I was actually gonna say the exact same thing. Like in between B and C, like A and D are way too extreme. Like obviously like in a utopian society, like everyone would be equal, like no matter if you were like broke or rich. Uh -huh. But like D is, it's just like way too extreme. Like they get like nothing. But like that's why like between B and C would probably be like okay. perfect. So now, y'all have your answer where you would go, what you would choose? Bro, you got yours, man? Do you know what you would choose? Yeah. Which one would you choose? Probably C. Okay. Do you know which one is the actual one? Do you guys know? Let's go to the, let's go to the next. Go. What's the actual distribution? So is it A, B, C, or D? I think we both think it's D. Yeah. You both think it's D? So let me ask you a question, right? How do you, if you both think it's D, is that what you were going to say, bro? Yeah, so how, if you both think it's D, like, how do you think people, if it's D, and we're going to talk about teams, and we're going to talk about, like, teams, like, people, Americans, people in the United States, who are, you know, you gotta, you, you want to get some sense that we're all on the same team, right? You got to work together, because if you, if you don't have that, and things start falling apart, then you have things like civil war, I mean, this is a problem, and so how, how well... How, to what degree does this distribution of wealth allow us to build really strong teams of people who are going to work together and see themselves as one nation? And Just a thought. How well does that do? Or which one do you think would build the best teams? Which, which option? A, B, C, or D? Um, I think probably C would be the best option to build the best teams. Because mm -hmm. even though everyone has like a little bit of everything, like the... Um 
like the top 20% would like be able to help out, but even like the bottom 20% would still like probably help out even though they didn't have that much money. Like they know what it's like. So even if uh -huh. they have like a little bit of money, they would like go to it. Still go for it. Like, yeah, still yeah. go for it. Yeah. Teresa, how about, would you say a similar thing or what would yeah, you say? Yeah, I would say it's similar. Like I would go for C considering um, I think D's like the reality. So I think C would be like, a good alternative, like not too extreme, like compared to B, I guess would be, be like extreme compared to today's society. So what do you think about, what do you think about D though, right? Like how do you think, think about building teams under D, like building, like look, building a world in which people feel connected to other people around them. Like what do you think, how do you, what, what do you, what role, how does D do with that? Like I think I think it would be like difficult because once people get up there, they have they get their reputation, then they have their ego, and then I think some people would just tend to get greedy, uh -huh. and they aren't gonna like build teams. It's kind of like an example of like Jeff Bezos is like he has like all this money, but like the Amazon workers are treated like horribly. So like if that was like building a team, like. It already failed. Well, how, but how do you feel as someone from the lower middle class? Like, how, do you feel really connected to, like the two of you are not on the same team, right? I mean, really, you're upper, upper middle class, lower middle class. I mean, you really not, I mean, you could be in lots of ways, but do you, to what degree do you feel like you're on the same team? I mean, you're here at Penn State, I don't know. Like, what do you feel? Um, I, like, we're on the same team, but we're not because we both got here. But I mean, I guess like a part of me like sometimes would be like jealous. Like I wish like I had that. Mm -hmm. If that's what like you're trying to say. I, yeah, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm really just curious, right? Because I wonder sometimes when I look at this and I think, so I, this is where, so I grew up right in between here. Okay, right in there. So like I know that for me, I didn't really think about it too much because I was living in my own kind of bubble. And, but things are very different now than they were back then. The inequality, this is far more greater than it was when I, when I was your age, right? So I, I don't know, like I'm always wondering like what, what it would be like to be there? Like, you know, here, like nothing. Let me show you a couple other things, all right? Go to the next slide. So here, this is, now this is income, family income, all right? So let me explain this to you. These are box, this is, each box here is 1%. So, down, so down here, this is gonna be like, so here's the richest 1% of, of Americans, okay, in terms of income. And in the richest 1%, we divide them up by 100, okay? And we see that like, whoa, here's like the uber rich. This is the richest one, 1,000th of, of families, okay? And 0.01%, and here's their average income is $23 million, almost $24 million. This group right here, the, the richest 10% of the 1%, this is their average income. And then this group right here, this is their average income, okay? So the, this is all the richest 1%, like right here, got it? You see that? It's like, oh my God, man. Like this is serious. And then we got right here, we got the, the next, the 9%, the richest, Next, next nine, um, the top decile, right? So this is the top 10%, the richest 10%. And they're averaging $161,000 on the families. But then we come down here, and this is the bottom 9%. This is the average. It's 29 to 30. I use this graph, but some people calculate it at about $31,000. When you take everybody and you average it out, the poorest 90% of Americans, that's their average income here. So how, how is that? How, how, I want to know, like, how are we going to build going into the future? How would you build teams, like a, a sense here in the United States? Like, how would you build a team that you really feel good about? Like, that you really, really feel like, hey, we can, we got this. We can do this. Come on, Americans. Like, how would you do that in this system? Um, I'm kind of like the worst person to ask about ifs because <laughs> what do you, I'm just confused, like, so what do you mean by a team? Like, like, everyone in the United States, like, how do you unite them? Yeah, like, well, not everyone, but you want to be, you know, you, you want to walk out, you want to walk out your door, you want to, 
you want to interact with people, whether they're even wealthier people or poorer people, but like if we want to have a society that functions and doesn't break apart, we want everyone to feel like, not everyone, but most people, you got to feel like people have something in common with other people, right? So like in the world of race, this is one of the things we're really struggling with, right? You've got to get people of different groups to feel like they got a lot in common. Because like black people, brown people, and white people have a heck of a lot more in common with one another than they do differences. And so we, gotta, we, gotta, is, we keep talking the message of difference, but we also got to talk the message of commonality. And so how do you do that in this system? Like how would you do it? I think looking at this, like comparing even just like close to like 3 million compared to 30K, like even, that, even though that's such a big difference, like I feel like if that was just it, like if that's almost where the cap was at 3 million, then that would be like fine, I guess. Like to me, that's like, okay, like this is not like super crazy, but I think it's just the top 0.01% is just where it gets like really different and you're just not gonna feel like you have anything in common at all. So I just think, if there was a way to even out that top 0.01% and spread that amongst the bottom 90%, then that would be ideal. It's just hard because obviously there are going to be those super rich people uh -huh. that are also like helping in a way, like sure. creating companies and jobs and stuff like yep. that. It's just, if there was a way to make it more equal, like somehow make it so that there's a mandate for how much they pay their workers or something yeah, yeah. like that. Obviously, like, it's just hard because it's their money and in the end, if they create the company and they're making all this, it's like, how okay. do you control where their money goes? Okay, so Miranda, how, how, when is super rich too super rich? Super rich is too, is when too super rich is actually like a great example is like Elon Musk just bought Twitter for like $44 billion, yeah. and like, that's like way super rich. It's just like an app, and then like, you could have put that money, to, I know it's like his money, but like, it could have been like so many other things. Yeah. Like, there was um, something I read on the, um, it was like a news site, and they did like a little document of how like, it would have been like, cure like the hunger in like the US or something for like 20 billion, and that was not even like half of what he like bought for Twitter, like that's too rich. Okay, so too rich, Okay, what else though? Because see, when we talk about these things, we often, we, we often go here. We go to the, the richest, you know, like 1% of the richest 1%, right? But, you know, what about just everybody else, right? Like, how do you, like, what's, like, what do we do? See, I, I don't have an answer to this, by the way. You, you, do, you should know me by now enough. You've been here all semester. Like, I don't have an answer. I'm just thinking it through, like thinking out loud. Like, when is it? Right? Like, when, when, does, when do these things stop, func stop functioning? Look, quick, can I ask you a question, actually? Have either of you, have either, this is a closed-ended question, right? How much do you think about this? This extreme inequality. How much do you think about it? A lot. Yeah? Yeah, I think, of, I think about it all the time. Because you're from lower middle class, so is that yeah. why? Yeah, it, and like a um, bunch of my friends growing up, like they were like the complete opposite. Uh -huh. And like even like my, um, like my grandparents on my dad's side, like they like weren't, um, like they were like middle class and like they built like a life for themselves. So like now like when they're older, like they don't have to look at anything. Mm -hmm. Like no bills, it's just like stocks and everything. Like they're like that rich. So like my dad never had to worry about it. Mm -hmm. But like when like I grew up with my sisters, like we had to worry about it. So like I think about it like all the time about like when I grew up, like I want to like have my kids like not worry about it. Okay, so how much do you think about, can you go back one? How much do you think about this though? Like, have you ever thought, like, hey, this actually, I'm going to ask you, Teresa, have you ever thought, like, this actually might be a problem? I would say I've thought about it, but not, like, as much mm -hmm. as, like, I would like to, I guess. Like, I'm not going to lie and be, like, I've thought about it and thought about, like, what I could do about it and stuff like that. Like, I haven't thought, like, very much in depth into mm -hmm. it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, mostly we don't, right? I mean, yeah. we're not, it's not something that's, you have to, you have to kind of dig, you have to dig a little bit to find it. I mean, you really have to, have to go there. Let me show you a couple other things. Um, so here, this is, so starting in 1983, which by the way is the year I graduated college, okay, and my undergrad, in 2010, there was a whole, whole bunch of wealth generated in this, in the system, in the, in the West, in the entire world. But especially in the West and especially in the United States. I mean, we j it was because th this was the beginning of the technological revolution. And it was just an explosion of new wealth that was generated via technology. Okay? And so in all this new wealth is going to go somewhere. Right? So you got the United States here. You got all these people. And you're going to do something with the wealth. It's going to, you, we're building it and the system is blowing up and all things are happening. And like the wealth's going to go somewhere to different people. So where's it going to go? Right? Where did it go? All this trillions of dollars that just emerged. Okay? So all those years of that new wealth, right? 27 years of new wealth. 74% of it went to the richest 5% of Americans, okay? Of all this new wealth, the next uh, 5%, the 90 to 95th percentile, 16% of it. And that means the richest 10% of Americans got almost 90% of the wealth of all this new wealth. So me, from when I've been conscious, when I started working, all these trillions of dollars that got earned went to the richest, just it's funneling up and up and up, which we've just never seen in human history like this, okay? The poorest 60% of Americans lost wealth. They actually lost it, relatively speaking, right? So they might have earned more money, but they lost wealth. Like it's harder to buy a house and a car, et cetera, et cetera, right? What do you make of that? Like, what do you make of that? I think that's pretty crazy. Like, um, even just sitting here thinking about and thinking about it more, I'm just thinking about how like people are talking about like taxes and stuff like that. And I'm just thinking about I'm like, at least for the top like five percent, like I understand why to push for tax more taxing and stuff, and. I just don't know how this happened. Like, there's just no, like, trickling. Like, you know, I like, just remember in history and they're talking about, like, trickling of wealth from, like, mm -hmm. from up here to down here and there's just none of that happening. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know how to fix that, but mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. pretty crazy. I didn't realize how bad it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know how to fix it either, by the way. And I don't... I don't, have, I don't have any answers, you know. I'm just, I'm just showing you this because this is, what, this is the conversation for today's class, right? Because now we're going to go in a different direction in a hot minute. But Miranda, what, how, how is that? How, what do you think this does for, listen, you're out, this is, this, this, is, this is us, right? This is the country right here. And you need these folks to get along. But what you're going to do is you're going to say, hey, but you know what? Like the richest... Uh, 5% of you, like you the, over here, you all right here, but we're going to generate all this like good stuff and, and we're going to give you 90% of it. Everybody else, hey, they're getting 90%. So you're going to have to live with that and we're going to have to work through it. Now you got to figure out how to convince these people that it's okay that they got 90% of it. How do you do, how are you going to, what are you going to say to them? How are you going to convince them? Um, I honestly would have no idea how to convince them because I would be like, yo, I'm on your side. <laughs> because, like, I, like, it's, like, crazy to even think about how, like, um, like, the top, like, 10% got 90 of it and, like, the bottom or, like, in the negatives up there, like, because, like, they, like, didn't have any wealth. But I would have no idea how to fix it. Listen, yeah, okay. So let me just be really clear here. No, these, these... 10%, they didn't all get together in a windowless room and decide, hey, we're going to make sure we steal all this. It's just the nature of how things evolved, right? No one's to blame. No one's at fault. It just happens that way. So it's not like uh, there's no conspiracy here. It's just like, but now that I'm asking the two of you, now your job is like, you got to figure out how to build teams here. You got to figure out how to get these people to somehow say like, hey, but listen, 
but it's okay that they have that. Like, you still work hard. We're still, come on, we're still in the same team. Like, this is all, we're, we're here together, right? How do you do that, right? How do you make that happen? Let me show you something else, right? Go to the next one. So, so here, let me just, by the way, um, these are Trump tax benefits, but the Obama tax benefits, the Biden tax benefit, the, the tax breaks, the whole thing, it's not very different, okay? There's not much difference at all between Republicans and Democrats. So like all of those, those of you who like have this thing about Trump, you, you know, I've never, I haven't said a word about Trump all semester. So you have this idea like, oh, I really hate Trump or I really love Trump, whatever. This isn't about, this isn't about him. This is just about how, once again, no one's responsible. It's just how the system plays itself out, okay? So here's the, this is the, these are tax breaks, okay? Because you understand, one way you jumpstart an economy, you gotta, get, you gotta get money into the economy and you gotta like get the wheels going. That's the nature of things. Like what happened with the pandemic, the wheels of life start slowing down and slowing down and slowing down and you're like, Oh man, if this comes to a stop, we're in trouble. We gotta like get some grease in those wheels and get some fuel in the fuel tank and we gotta get it going again. And so one way you do that is with tax breaks, right? Okay, great. Obama did it, you know, Clinton did it before, Bush did it. Okay, so here's, and they all, and they all look very similar to this. The richest 20%, this is all the tax breaks they got. Okay, the next 20%, this is their tax breaks. The next, the middle 20%, this is theirs. The second richest, second poorest 20%, this is theirs. And this is the poorest people. These are tax breaks. So if you're poor, your tax break amounted to like $121 at the end of the year. Okay? So now I want to ask you, like, okay. So, so here, we're going to go to the next one. Okay? This is neither good nor bad. This is, this is what it is. This is where we're at. So go, go to the next one. This is the actual wealth distribution. So it very much mirrors this. All right? So now what do you say? What do you say to these folks to say, not only is this unequal, but I'm going to give, not, not only is that unequal, but here's what's going to happen. You all, and I want to hear, and each of you have to come up with a statement here, right? You all, um, I'm gonna get, you're going to get the most tax breaks, okay? So it's cool. You all, hey, you're going to get great tax breaks too. Isn't this amazing? But you're not going to know that they look like this. Go, go back one slide. You're not going to know they look like this because you're not going to pay attention and you're not going to notice. So tell them, what, what are you going to tell them? So that they're a team. So that they feel good. And you, you need them to be connected with these people because if they're not connected with these people, things fall apart and then we got a problem. They can maybe be thought of like as a team, like they were both given money, like, even though you mm -hmm. have money, like, you're still working. So, it kind of be, like, both be grateful that, like, you did get money, yeah. maybe. Okay. That's awesome. Teresa, how about you? Um, there's, like, I just can't even think of anything to say because if I was this group, I would just hate them. <laughs> so, like... You would I, hate them? What do you mean you would not hate, hate them? them, but it's just like, I understand what you're trying to say. Like, it's just, even though, like, we're all human and stuff, we have all these things in common, like, mm -hmm. I feel like money is just something that's, like, so easy to look at. Like, you know, I'm not, like, when I look at people, like, it's easy to tell how much money they have, not, like, oh, we both have this in common and, like, our personalities and stuff. Uh -huh. Like, so it's just such an easy factor to be divided by since it's just so, like, right there. Yeah. So, um, like, I would see why, like, it's hard to put them and think we're all on the same team and working together because... Because it's difficult. Yeah. Like, you're, you're not sure what you would say here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, one, th I, I, I don't know, I don't know either. I mean, I have things that I would say, but I know, like, if I'm thinking about how to re really rebuild this somehow, and this isn't, this doesn't have to stay this way, and hey, this doesn't have to stay this way, and it won't stay this way. Things will change, right? But the point is, you know, we're really in a, we're, we're, we are in a situation Whereby, and once again, this isn't, you know, y'all like, there are a lot of people that have this idea that, well, you know, the, the, the Republicans are the, the party of, of 
whatever, and the Democrats are the party of whatever over here, and like they're all conspiring against everybody else. It's not working that way. It just happens. It just happens. And so now we got to figure out, like, okay, what, what, what do we do? How do we do this? Because if we don't, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's like the greatest fear that you have about this society? That like money is going to get like used as like a weapon uh-huh. about like how, like she said, like they're going to like kind of like hate each other, like kind of be like jealous of each other. I mean, like that's already like a part of the world today, but like it's going to get like worse maybe. I think I'm just scared of the divide getting even bigger uh-huh. and where it's almost like if you have money, you have like, like in other countries, it's like you almost have like power in other ways, like even like politically and stuff. Uh huh. And what if you don't have, what if, but if you're over here, it's not just about money. It's also just about identity. Maybe they, you don't, it's not about having money. Maybe you just come like this group of people over here, they just band together because they're just angry. And they don't, they don't really know what the numbers are. They're just really angry. And so they're just going to go after that group or this group. Or maybe this group will go after that group up there. Just because. On the basis of anything. They just start hating and fighting. And, like, and we don't even know why. But they're just angry. They feel left out and they feel left behind. And like they don't know what else to do. So they just start fighting. And we have no one. We, have, we just have. If we're not finding some way to build these connections. Then it, the whole thing falls apart. Man. So, yeah. Huh. All right. Well, we're going to have a conversation right now. And then maybe at the end of the conversation, you can come back up and you can say what you learned and now what you, how, what you would do. All right. Is that cool? Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, um, you know, so the, so the thing is, y'all, let's be really clear. You can just leave it off. Um, we, 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 there are things, as, as a sociologist, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, there are, there are ways in which we can bring people together or we can divide them. Groups, whatever the groups are, we, we find ways to bring us together or divide further. And they're both... The, the, the fear is that, um, the concern is that we don't have enough people who are in positions who really are willing to learn how to do that. And even if they were in positions to learn how to do that, people in Washington or leaders around, like whatever it is, they don't have anyone who can teach them the skills of how to actually build a team. Because you don't just, learn, look, I, I have a team. And, 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 I, and, and I just, I learn by failing. And it's really difficult to do. And you think I'd be good at it because, you know, I'm a social, this is what I do, right? I work with people. Ah, it's really difficult to do. And so um, I think that for all of us, it'd be a really good idea to have a few lessons about team building and teams. And, and so we take those into our lives so that when we have opportunities to do this, then we really have ways to talk about it. So with that in mind, I invited someone into class today who could teach us something about building teams and, uh, and how to do it, how to build a team and how to make it and what it takes, like really what it takes. And... Um, are we good? All right, man. Um, come on. Yeah, come on down. So here's our special guest today. All right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm really, I'm glad you got to hear some of that because it really, it sets up, it sets up the importance of you. Yeah. How are you, man? Good? Good. Good. Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, thanks for coming. So, you know, you are the, you can sit on the table if you want. You can be wherever. I got, I got, I've got questions for you. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hey, so it, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Is Jaden Sider here? Right there. Man. Was he 10 minutes early? He was, uh, he was eight minutes early. Eight minutes early. He was sitting lifted. close to the front row, wearing a hat. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. <laughs> he was lifting, though. No, I appreciate I keep, it. Yeah. Hey, um, so, so you, you know, you heard s some of this conversation, and you know, you know my work in this world of race and ethnicity, but it's not just race and ethnicity. It's all, it's really about b bringing people together in different ways. Yep. And, and so, um, so my first question, and so you, you've got, I've listened to you many times. Look, hey, I'm going to say something about you, all right? Really fast? Yes, sir. Yeah. You don't, a lot of people don't have the, um, the opportunity to meet certain people up close and hear them. Like, hear them just talking, just talking about things, not in like press conferences, just talking. And sometimes you listen to people and you hear what they're saying and you realize that person has got a vision. That person sees it, that person understands. And for you, you're very much a sociologist. You see things that most, you didn't get to this position, you got to this position because you see things that other people don't see. So in this world of team building and teams, um, how do you do that? How do you do it? And I got well, several questions here, but you just okay. go and then we'll see where we go. Well, I think the, the first thing I would say is I was fortunate because I was blessed to be born into this world from the beginning and have a little bit of a different perspective than most. And I'm not even sure if everybody kind of understands my background or knows my background, um, but I'm biracial. So when I was sitting in the back of the class and when I came a few years back, um, I actually think that's a huge advantage for me. My dad is, was African American. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force. He was stationed in Manchester, England. Met my mom, they eloped to Ireland. Then he brought her back to this really romantic city called Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Started popping out beige babies, me and my sister. And I think it's allowed me to have a pretty unique perspective on the world in, in general, and it's allowed me to really identify and get, a, get, a, get along with a lot of people from very different backgrounds. Um, in the United States, the only family that I grew up with and knew is all African American. Uh, was raised by my mom, who's Caucasian. Uh, my mother was a janitor at my high school. Um, so I got a pretty unique background and perspective. I went to a small school in Pennsylvania called East Stroudsburg. And then I've lived all over the country. I lived in nine different states uh, or countries after I graduated from college. Uh, lived overseas for six months in, in Denmark. Um, so I got a pretty good perspective, and then I've continued on that. My wife is Nigerian, so we have two daughters that are 15 and 14 years old, so I think those experiences help, mm -hmm. if that mm -hmm. makes sense, because when you're putting a team together, whether that is a staff, I have 45 staff members, or whether it's the team, we have 125 players from all different backgrounds, um, whether it's rural, whether, whether it's urban, whether it's black or white, whether it's Catholic or Jewish. You know, in our country right away when you say diversity, right away people think black and white. And diversity is so much more than that, obviously. So for me, whether it's my staff or my team, I want to make sure that we have enough representation that everybody feels like they have a voice or that every player that I recruit and bring in, they have somebody within the organization that they can identify with. Mm. So I think diversity is critical. So how do you, tell, what, are, what are like some of the, the tricks of the trade, right? Like what do you know that other people don't know? Like you, you know, you hear this conversation I'm having, what are these two young women, what do they need to learn? What do you know that, that really other folks could know? Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't speak on that. Um, no, but, no, not on those issues. What do you know as a coach? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I guess what I'm saying is I can't speak to what they don't know and yeah, what I know. Yeah. I don't know them well enough. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just think I've always been a very curious person. And mm -hmm. I think curiosity is a really important trait. 
uh, for anybody in a leadership position or really anybody um, that's going to go on and be a father, a husband, a businessman, or woman one day. I think curiosity is a really, really valuable trait, uh, being willing to ask enough questions and be a life, lifelong learner. So for me, um, I've just been very curious. My undergraduate degree is in psychology, mm -hmm. and I was always curious in how people think, uh, how groups think. Um, and for me, that's kind of been a lifelong journey in how can I bring a group of people together and get them to connect uh, on a common cause. And people Got with you. very different yeah. Yeah. backgrounds, yeah. very different backgrounds. And, and different, different skills, different desires, different inclinations. I mean, you, you know, people have this idea. So I, I just want to emphasize this. People have this idea. It's like, well, you got these 120 young men, and then you have your staff, and they, well, they all have one single goal, and they're all the same. They all play football. No, no, no. They all come from very different backgrounds, and they have different ways of seeing the world. And so your job is to somehow take all those disparate individuals and make them gel together. What's the, like, what's the key? Like, what's the... Yeah, I, I think it, it starts with being very intentional about it, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to work really hard at trying to bring a group of people together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of different ways to do that. We, we, we have a couple different things that we do that I think have been important. Um, one of them, it sounds ridiculous, but any new person into our organization, whether it's a staff or player, they have to get up in front of the team. It's a little bit like an icebreaker. They have to get up in front of the team and they have to either sing a song or dance. And getting up in front of the team and being willing to be vulnerable and let people laugh at you or you laugh at everybody else, um, I think it kind of sets, sets the tone. That, that's one thing we do. We do yeah. a thing called shares uh -huh. where our entire team will get up throughout the season and they have to tell a story about something personal in their background. Could be sensitive, could be, could be funny, but a story about their background that maybe the team doesn't know or understand that is going to allow us to become closer. Try to do things away from the football building, whether it's going bowling or going swimming or doing activities or coming to the coaches' houses. Uh, the other thing is our locker room is set up, and it's very intentional, and that changes every single year. So what I mean by that is most locker rooms are set up where all the quarterbacks sit over here and the O-linemen sit over here and the D-linemen sit over here, and people say that their team is a family, but they're really not. You know, it's, it's a large team and it can be very clicky. So we rotate our locker room every single year where you're not going to sit next to somebody at your position. You're not going to sit next to somebody on your side of the ball. Yeah. Um, so our entire locker room is broken up quarterback next to a D lineman, next to a kicker, next mm -hmm. to an O lineman. And then it's also broken up racially. The entire locker room is broken up as much as we possibly can. Black, white, black, white, black, white. Uh -huh. Throw a beige guy like in myself, like myself, culturally uh -huh. ambiguous. And, and kind of work through the entire locker room that way. Because you'd be amazed just sitting next to two people yeah. for an entire year and having conversation allows you to form relationships that you normally may not. So I, I want to just tell a story. Um, back in the, I started here in 1990. And I, for, I've always been teaching a lot of, a lot of players on the team. Um, so, and uh, so I forget who I was speaking with, but I was asking them. But it, might, it might have been remember O.J. McDuffie. Remember O.J.? Mm -hmm. It might have been O.J. And I was asking him, like, hey, who do you hang out with on the team? And it was like, well, you know, the wide receivers, we all hang out together, and the linebackers hang out together. And, like, all, everybody hung out by position. About five years ago, I was asking somebody, and, you know, uh, one of the players, like, okay, so you, you must you hang out with all the, like, de it was maybe a defensive back. You must hang out with all the defensive backs. They're like, no. And I said, well, who do you hang out with? Well, we hang out with everybody. I'm like, yeah, but the team's divided. Don't you all, like, really hang out with your own pos other people in your position? It's like, no, we don't do that. And it really struck me. So this is, and I always wondered why. I just thought it just randomly changed. But what I just got right now is that, no, you do that intentionally. And that's big. Yeah, and I think that's somewhat unusual in, uh -huh. in college football, and I would even say in the NFL. I've coached in the NFL as well. I don't think it's really set up like that. Yep. And I think that's allowed us to achieve some things that maybe our talent wouldn't allow us to uh -huh. uh, based on those relationships and that chemistry in the office. It's awesome. 
Hey, so you, so I, I've heard a couple things here that really are standing out. One is um, diversity is key. Diversity is a strength. You want people from different way, you want people who have different ways of seeing the world and different backgrounds and et cetera. Like that's really important. And, and let me add to that. Yeah. that that's also f important for me in the leadership position. So ultimately, I'm gonna make what I think is the best decision for the organization. But the only way for me to really do that is to make sure I've heard from all the parties. So I wanna hear from the players and get their perspective. I wanna hear from the coaches and get their perspective. I wanna hear from the staff and get their perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a large number of women on our staff. I wanna hear their perspective because they have a unique lens. Yep. Yep. Older, older staff member, experienced staff member, younger staff members. For me to make the best decision for the overall organization, I need to hear from everybody, take all that information in. That's where diversity is key. Yep, yep. yep. That's just the thing that we, I think sometimes this conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion that we have in this kind of very generalized way, what gets lost in that conversation to a great degree is actually the, the, ra the sociological and psychological rationale for why we want that or why it has value for any organization. Well, I think the problem is, is most organizations are doing it because they have to yep, based yep. on a philosophy or a belief within the organization or a policy that's in place. Mm -hmm. and, and what you really hope is that you're doing it for the right reasons to, to gain those different perspectives mm -hmm. that are going to be extremely valuable to the organization as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one would imagine, right? But sometimes we just get lost in the, the doing for the sake of doing. But, but, this, but listen, but this is what separates the okay leaders and the average leaders from the really good ones. And at the same time, it's what separates the average coaches from the really good coaches. I mean, let's just be clear, right? These are the kinds of things. It's the same like professors. I mean, it's a similar kind of thing, right? The other thing that you said is this vulnerability question, the vulnerability issue, how central that is for you. And I just, I feel that this is something that we talked about a little bit. Last class we talked about mental health and had some students who got really vulnerable about mental health issues. And I, w I was saying that to the class, like that is the one issue that students ask me to talk about more than any other single issue is, is mental health and the vulnerability. And it's vulnerable, you, you get really vulnerable in talking about that. Hey, when you were recruiting, I wanna go in a slightly different direction. So when you're recruiting somebody, you're, you're not just recruiting the individual, you're recruiting their family. You're recruiting their whole, in a way, their nuclear family. You're recruiting their friends, you're recruiting many things, right? Am I right about that? That's like, correct. How, do you, how does that factor in? Like, what are you looking for when you talk to parents? Like, what, what are you looking for in the, in the parents? Like, what are you, well, hang on, maybe that's a little too much, but. How does it factor in? Let me just say that, and you just go. How does recruiting factor in? And yeah, how, recruiting how we go about you're, you're not just factoring in the ability for that one person to do something really well. Yep. You're looking at many more things than that. Yeah, so the, the first thing that I try to tell my staff all the time is don't get intoxicated by talent and talent alone. So it's obviously, it's easy to turn on a videotape and watch a really good player. Um, most of the players that, that we're recruiting are so much better than the guys that they're playing against that it should be pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. And then you wanna dig deeper from there. So it's looking at the transcript and see what type of classes they've taken, what their GPA is, how many absences they have, how many tardies they have, because it tells you about them. And then obviously getting a chance to meet with the family. And whether it's a single parent home or whether it's two parent home, is this a parent or parents that are trying to be their, their, their children's friend? Or are they trying to be their parents? Do they have what I call as home training? Uh, are they respectful of their mom? Uh, are they respectful of their dad? If they're not, then they're probably not gonna be respectful once they get on campus. Eye contact, handshakes, all these things, how they sit in their chair, um, all these things I think are really, really important. We talk to other people in the community. We talk to other people in the community about how they are. It's amazing, I'll walk into a school and I'll be standing in the principal's office or in the lobby there and I'll ask another student, so what do you think of Johnny Smith? And they either roll their eyes or they say, hey, he's, a, he's an unbelievable young man and for all the reasons he is. But then the other reason is 
finding out who their support system is. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. Parents, high school coach, aunt, uncle, guardian, uh, Pop Warner coach, Little League coach, whatever it may be, somebody in the community that is impactful on this, on this young man for a couple reasons. Number one, because I want to be able to know all these people that are going to influence him and have a part of his decision-making process. But then even more important than that, once they get on campus, now I can use them as a part of the process to help me reach them yep. and help guide them. So if I'm having a challenge, whatever it may be, I can pick up the phone and call these people and get their advice. I think one of, one of the great examples of that is Micah Parsons, who obviously is doing really well right now in the NFL with the Cowboys. Um, Dan Quinn, the defensive coordinator for the Cowboys, called me throughout the entire season. You know, coach, I'm dealing with this issue with Micah. What is your thoughts? What's the best way to reach him on that? And I think it's a big reason. Obviously, Micah is an unbelievable talent. But I think his relationship with his coach and his coach willing to kind of yeah, go the yeah. extra mile to figure out how to reach and connect with him allowed Micah to be defensive rookie of the year in the NFL as well. So, right, it's like if you're a parent, you, you knew your child as an infant. And so you get, a real, you get your ability to really work with that, that child. And so by the, by the time they're a teenager or wherever they are, you've had a sense of who they are and what they are. And, but you don't, you don't have that. It's like I don't, have, I don't have that either. Nor do any of us who are really trying to bring these disparate individuals together and build these teams, whatever the teams are. So now I want to I ask you, a, 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 what, what do you do? So what, so my concern Really, I mean, you heard me talking. My one concern is we've created these divisions in this country that, that we may not, we're going to have a very difficult time mending them. And, 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 I, and I have a lot of concern for that because I'm not, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to. It, we could just fall off the cliff. And, and I, I don't even like saying that, but, but, it's my, but, but it's why I continue doing what I do. So... As I was asking these two young women, so what do you do with a divided society? And, and I don't have an answer. So as a coach, what do you do with a divided team? Like when, when that happens, like what do you do? Well, I think you use the word commonalities. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And was this, was it the 10% or was it the 2% or the 1%? Yeah, 1%? the 10% 10, 10 over here. Yeah, 10%. Yeah. I, I guess, and you guys kind of talked about it and you, and you hit on it. And it was kind of like I talked about with the locker room. If you can find ways to get people together. Now, first of all, they either have to be willing to get together or be in a situation where in the football team they're forced to right. be together. Right. Like the locker room, it, you spend time talking to people. We are much more in common with one another yep. than the opposite. So, As is the case here. If all these people over here sat down and talked to all these folks over here. Correct. And if you, could, if you could force this group somehow, yep. force yep. may not be the right word, yep. but encourage this group to study this group yep. and get this group to study that group, um, how, they, how they got into this situation, um, how they were able to achieve what they've achieved, um, I, I think it, it, it would help. I, I'm not sure yeah. if it's the answer. I don't, I don't have the answer yeah, either, yeah, I but I, I'm, I'm always amazed. I put a kid at this locker and two kids on either side of them, and they have nothing in common. Um, by the end of the year, they're really good friends. I, right yeah. now I'm doing something that is, is powerful but also painful. At the end of every year, I meet with every single one of my players one-on-one -on -one for a half hour and kind of go through a whole end of the year kind of questionnaire with them. And literally a young man was just talking about it t today, Olu Fashano, I just got done meeting with one of our offensive linemen, and he was talking about two players on either side of him that he did not know at all and by the end of the season have now become two of his best friends. Yeah. And and. Yeah. I don't even know if they know how different they are, mm -hmm. but I do. Because one of the other advantages that I have is I'm able to go into each one of our players' homes yep. and hometowns and see who they really are. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing I find, and I'm not sure if it is with the overall student population, 
a lot of people come to college, I know in football, and they try to put on a perception yeah. of who they want people to think they are, yeah. and they're yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. I, I just find it, it fascinating. I really do in, in what you're talking about in team building, in getting a group to come together and gel. And obviously, I, I wouldn't say that that is going to be the determining factor in our success every, every year, but it's a major part of it. Talent also factors in, obviously, mm -hmm. scheme and uh, X's and O's and philosophy also factors in. But, but the chemistry is a huge component of it. Yeah. The word culture is thrown around yeah. you know, a lot yeah. in organizations. And I don't even think anybody spends any time talking about what culture really is. Yeah, yeah, the complexities of it, right? So it's like, it is that there's this place you go into, like the zone. And you, you, if you're going to go into the zone with your teammates, you're only going to go into the zone with them because there's a sense of, of respect and camaraderie and connection. And trust. Else, it, and trust, or else it's just not going to happen. Because that goes back to that vulnerability. Yeah, I was just going to Like, say you're not going to get up and be vulnerable in front of the team yeah. unless you trust. It's no different than a relationship with a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband or a wife. Yeah. At some point in that relationship, mm -hmm. for you to take it to the next level, you got to put yourself out there. Yeah. And the challenge yeah. is a lot of times once you've been burnt, burnt or hurt, you stop putting yourself out there. Yeah. And it's the same way on a team. Yeah. You know, last, last weekend, uh, I was in Scranton doing some work with, uh, with the, the uh, bus company, right? And so I had, I had a meeting with drivers. And I just heard things out of the mouth of, of people, out of the mouths of people who I shouldn't, I didn't expect to hear. And, you know, I'm from the working class, so like I used to drive a forklift, I've done a lot of things, but I heard things and I said, man, you know, all, all the, the people who I know who are really liberal and really on the left and really supportive of all the liberal cause, they need to sit down and talk to this person who they would pass by on the street and never give them the time of day and never assume that they were anything but somebody who is opposite of everything that they were. And I see you have so much in common. It was so fascinating to do that. And I think that's what, what I'm hearing from you is it, just, it doesn't just happen that you build a team. It's not just because you all, get, you, you all come together in one workplace or one community or whatever it is. It only happens because people are deliberately and very consciously saying, like, we need to bring you all together and we need to make sure that you operate as a system that's very cohesive and it works. And, and that's a message that I feel like we need more of that message because I'm not getting that. You know, especially coming out of Washington, and many leaders and so on are just like, it's all about division. It's all about, you know, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in my place because of divisions. Um, final question, because I know you gotta go, right? How do you, um, Last time you were here, I, I asked you a version of this, but... Can, can I say something about yeah. last time I was here? Yeah. So last time I was here, I was standing in the back, and I, it was fascinating. You were talking about race, and I actually remember one of the slides, and you were showing eyes and nose and lips, uh -huh. and based on your eyes, nose, and lips, yeah. um, you, could, you could determine where people were from around the world. I think, is that correct? Something similar to yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are a lot of facial features that are, that are uniquely located uh, in particular geographic regions of the world. Yep. Of course, it's all mixed up. Yep. But there are certain things that you can identify and say, that, yeah, that person's probably from one place. And I don't know if you remember, I came with Michael Hazel, who was my yeah, director of football right. operations yep. at the time. And, and Michael was adopted and comes from a Hispanic background. Well, you did the saliva test? Yeah, yeah, we did that. We did him. the saliva test to, to, to do backgrounds? Well, I think you got it mixed up, because when mine came back, I was Hispanic, and Michael was black. Uh. Um, <laughs> so I don't know who handled that oh, for yeah, you. Oh, yeah, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> caused a little concern there yeah. for a minute. <laughs> well, one never knows, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, so if we, uh, how do you mean... So, so one of the things that I'm, I'm observing now is just the d leaders of different groups and different communities just lobbing bombs at one another. Just like, just bombs, just hatred, right? Just, 
everything negative, whatever it is, just put the other person down because we're going to, if we, the more we can put them down, the more we can lift ourselves up, right? So people have the idea that, you know, okay, playing sports, it's all about winning. But from what I, from we just heard you talking about, it's not about winning. It's about taking these, it's not just about winning. It's also, you take all these disparate people and you're bringing them together because you're also creating and socializing young human beings to be better than what they are, right? That's, that's also a part of it. But, um, but my question is, how, how do you do this, do what you do, and still... How does respect for the other teams and respect for the other coaches and respect for the other players come in? Like, how do you manage that? Because, you know, you're going to go against other coaches who maybe were friends of yours, right? Or players who maybe you didn't, you recruited them and you were in their houses and you met their parents and you really want the best for them. You like them and you love their parents and you think like, okay, but they're now on a different team. And so you're doing everything you're doing trying to win, but yet still having respect. And so... I'm asking this because there's so many people sitting in these different pods in our society that have lost the respect for people who they think are compl on the other teams. And then they start developing this hatred and just like everything negative about them. But, but you can't do that. And so how do you do that? Like what's the, what's the trick? Like, okay, I'm going to, I think, answer your question. Right. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important that we've gotten away from, whether it's as a country or whether it's football or whether it's Penn State, is the way I understand government and the way everything was structured is we're all trying to do what's best mm -hmm. for the people in our society in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way I see it in a strange way. I see it in, in footballs. And I think that's one of the things yeah. that I think we have forgotten is it's not just about winning for Republicans and Democrats. We should be doing what's best for the United States and for the people of, of our country. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was fortunate enough to go to the State of the Union when Obama was in. And one of the things that was really sad for me sitting in the audience was Obama would say something and the Republicans would all stand up, uh, excuse me, the Democrats would all stand up and cheer and the Republicans would sit there and not respond yeah. and give dirty looks. Yeah. And I just said to myself, it's a shame because not everything he is saying is right and not everything he's yeah. saying is wrong, yeah. but it was so divided in that room I'm like, we have no chance of getting anything done because it's not about what's in the best interest of the United States and the people. Mm -hmm. It's about being right or wrong. Yeah. And I don't know how we've gotten there. You, know, you talk about us being built on being the most competitive society in the world. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's now become about winning and winning at all costs. Because uh -huh. it's funny you talk about at Penn State, it's more than that. And I get it. Uh-huh. If it was just winning and losing, I'd go coach in the NFL, and I've had opportunities to do that. In college, it's still about using the game of football to teach life lessons. Yeah. But, Sam, can I, can I call you Sam? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Is that okay? Dr. Yeah. Richards? Yeah, and Sam is good. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but let's be honest. Everybody wants you to teach those, those life lessons, and I think Penn State, that's really important. What? That's really important yeah. at Penn State. But let's be honest, only when you're winning. Yeah, 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 yeah. When, when we win, there's nothing better than 107,000 fans in that stadium and another 100,000 fans outside the stadium tailgating, maybe having a better time than the people in the stadium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when we lose, no one cares about the values yep. and the things that we're yep. teaching. Yep. They're ready to run my tail out of town. Yep. But, but, you're, but you're still dealing with 120 young men. Correct. You're still, even when you lose, you're still trying to make them better tomorrow than what they are today. That's exactly right. And so that's still part of it. It's always yep. part of it yep. with me. But what I'm saying is, yep. as a society, yep. I think we've gotten caught up in winning and losing at all costs. And that's with everything, yep. which, which we should be doing what's best for the student athletes. We should be doing what's best for Pennsylvania State University. And, and we've been fractured with some topics in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is my, this is a big, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to solve it. Well, listen, I wanted you to come in to talk about this because I want,
people to have the opportunity to see that everything and everybody is much more complex than we imagine them to be. But you say you don't know how to solve it. You, you do because that's what you're doing here every yeah, yeah. day in your class, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Forcing people to have conversations about topics they normally wouldn't have conversations about. Yep. Yeah, and not imposing my ideas, just like you sit down with people and you're asking them, what do you think? The 30-minute conversation that you have with each person, they're doing, I'm assuming they're doing most of the talking because like that's not going to work any other way. Correct. And so it's similar here. That's why I bring students up and say, listen, you figure it out. Come up with an answer. I don't, I don't have, in my 61 years, I think I, I feel like I'm getting less intelligent year by year. Uh, yeah. Or I'm just more confused. I don't know, man. Maybe I'm more confused. I doubt that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe it's not just because I'm actually asking the questions. So, um, listen, you, I think you need to go. Well, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. If you want to stay, you can stay. I mean, I, it's up to you. There'd probably be a few students like to meet you. Uh, I don't know about, I don't know if that's a great idea, but, uh, I think I got something else on my calendar. Heidi's, Heidi's basically Heidi's telling got me it. I got to go. Heidi's All my right. boss. He's going to send you out. All right. Well, listen, thanks. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, nice job. Yeah. I'm going to I'm bring I'm bringing uh just so you know, I'm bringing Jaden up here now. All right. Yeah, I'm going to ask you I'm going to grill him. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, have a seat. Um Hey, so listen, tell me how so how, how is it for you, everything that we were talking about here, how is it for you as someone on a team? Really, what, what, what happened for you in those first, like when you entered and what was the process? We have five minutes here. Okay, so I'm giving you the quick rundown. Like what he said about the locker rooms, like true. Like I've made so many connections on the team and like people are so different. People come from all different like parts of the country, people have different beliefs. But like at the end of the day, none of that matters because like we're all there for a common goal. And, like, I've made so many friends just by, like you said, moving my locker. Like, the year goes by, and, like, I'm talking to someone every day that I never used to talk to. And, like, like you said, you, you become, like, best friends like that. So what do you think when we were, I think that what we were talking about here is in some ways a metaphor for where we need to be as a, as a society, right? Like, what do you, and by the way, did the two of you, did, do, you have, do you have an answer? Did you come up with something? For what we need to do? Did you have any ideas? Wait, hang on. What's that? I was just saying that I think people just need to talk more. Like, I was, like, kind of thinking about this when I was up there, when I was saying, like, money's such an easy thing to look at, but yep. then once you really get talking to someone, you will actually connect with them, and maybe we just need more talking between this side and that side, and maybe, like, the rich people realize, like, oh, like, what I thought about, like, people are poor just because they don't work hard isn't true, and yeah. maybe this side will realize, like, oh, like, money doesn't solve everything, and they still have other things in common. Like, when we first met, we were, realized we had both had dis divorced parents, and so even though, like, we were both brought up because we were from different classes, yeah. Like, that was something that we already realized we had in common. Yeah. It was also, like, seeing it from a different perspective. Like, um, like he said, like, the locker rooms. Like, if you could walk in, like, another person's shoes as well. Like, kind of, like, switching it up a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. What, what do you, what have you, let me just, here, here's my final question. Like, what have you, what have you learned about yourself um. since really starting to meet all these different people, like, as everybody does, but, like, what have you learned about yourself? What, what have you learned about yourself that you could only learn because, this is actually a question I want to ask, because you had someone coaching you along in these life ways, not just in the... Um, I said, like... Sport ways. I really don't know as, as much as I think I did about, mm -hmm. like, people, like, different backgrounds, and then, like, just about myself. Like, I feel like I've learned so much in the last, like, three years I've been here mm -hmm. about like how to develop as a person, just become mm -hmm. a better person every day and just uh, think more about others. So one of the things that I was saying that, because I, I, I've taught, they've been taught hundreds of players over the years, right? And a lot of folks that 
you know, people would know. But this idea of, of the coaching, it's not just about, and, it, and the reason I'm emphasizing this, you all understand, I understand sports, right? I can do a political economy of sports as well as anybody can, trust me, right? I can do a critique of sports up and down, left and right, as well as anybody who wants to critique sports, okay? I am, I'm not a, I'm not a fan, I'm not a, a fanboy, so to speak, right? But it is important that people see that just like politicians are not one-dimensional, that leaders, all leaders are not one-dimensional. So like, what do you get from being coached that you wouldn't get anywhere else? And you got 30 seconds. Right. So when I get coached, I wouldn't get anywhere. Yeah, like what do you get? Like when we were talking about here, it's like, hey, it really is about a team and yeah. it's about so building it's, it's way people. more about uh, than just winning. Like he builds us to be the people he wants us to be. Like, like you said, leaders, like businessmen, like owners, like all of that. So it's not just about football at the end of the day. He wants us to be the best versions of ourselves, And then I don't think we will do that without him. Yeah, I, I hear that, man. And we, need, and we need more coaches. We need more people with that ability. All right, thanks, man. Thanks, y'all.